Hello everybody and welcome to Cine Formation number 43. Can we have a quick show of hands? Who's never been to a Cine Formation event before? Well, especially welcome to you all. Um, it was set up over three and a half years ago to help foster a creative, vibrant frenzy of filmmaking in the Southwest. And what happens is every month we show a bunch of films made by local filmmakers and get them up to talk about a different aspect of their filmmaking. So it's a different theme each month. Next month is animation. Um, and this month we're doing something slightly different. Instead of having a selection of different we're obviously focusing on one person, so please switch your phones off. And uh, have in mind, if you have, I'm sure so many of you will have questions that could be um, uh, popped for Richard later, but um, by all means be thinking of stuff. It's, I'm going to take maybe the first half, we're going to show a few clips, but then I would, I would love to hear some witty, concise, insightful questions from you as well. Uh, the, the whole idea of some information is it's more as interactive as possible. But um, without further ado, please help me welcome to the stage, Richard Eyre. <coughs> Another question. Um, yes, we're on wheels, so don't don't move too too suddenly. Uh, who has how many, hands up? Who has seen the film already? Notes on a scandal. Okay. Who is going to see it at half eight? Excellent. Okay, that's that's excellent. Well, you'll be moving next door with Richard in due course then. So, um, why why this film? Um, I know you're supposed to say that. Uh, this is an idea that I, I'd been nursing for years because the myth about um, film um, is that the director is the auteur. There are very, very few examples of films which are actually generated, written, directed by the director. And um, uh, Shane Meadows' film, is, he's an example. You know, uh, there are a few examples, Mike Lee's film, uh, most films are films that are made uh, like this film. Um, I wouldn't say I was just, you know, jobbing director for hire, but in essence, I'm a jobbing director for hire. Uh, I was approached by, I did a film um, about six or seven years ago um, called Iris, also with Judy Dench. Um, that also, well, that was authored by me and by a writer called Charles Wood. I mean, let's say I wrote the screenplay, but it was initiated by a, a Hollywood studio um, who actually, at my prompting, asked me if I would write and direct the film. Um, this film, um, Notes on a Scandal, was actually, what happened with, i continued continue, the Iris story, um, the, the studio, Columbia Pictures, um, commissioned me a very nice man uh, who'd been running the studio for many years called John Kelly. He commissioned me because I'd been working with Judy Dench and in fact I was working with her the day um, in New York, the day after she won the Oscar for, for um, uh, Shakespeare in Love. And we were walking down a street and she literally stopped the traffic. People were going, hey, Judy, Judy, Judy! Uh, and um, she stopped the traffic and we went into a, a coffee house and I said, now what are you going to do next? And she said, well, I've been uh, approached, there's an interesting project. I've been asked if I would play Iris Murdoch in a film based on her husband, John Bailey's books about Iris Murdoch. Iris Murdoch, you know, was celebrated British novelist, married to a literary critic who wrote two wonderful books about her decline from Alzheimer's. So opportunistic as ever, I said to Judy, who is writing the script and who is directing? She said, I have no idea, I don't think they have anyone. So I then wrote, contacted John Kelly, who I knew slightly because he'd been interested in a film that I made actually 25 years ago. Um, or what, yes, I, I think the Falklands, about the Falklands War called Tumbledown. Or, no, the events were 25 years ago. The film was made 20 years ago. Um, and so I said, would you consider me directing the film? Anyway, he, I heard nothing for some time. And then he came back and said, yes, would you write the film and direct it? I thought, this is easy. <laughs> What's the problem? Um, uh, the problem was that I wrote the film. I, I then it recruited my friend Charles Wood, who had written Tumbledown uh, those years before. 
uh, wrote the screenplay. John Kelly said, I love it, I love it, I love everything about it. Um, and then they didn't make it. So I was left with a script that they paid for and then had to go around raising money for the film. So I approached various people, one of whom was a producer who probably is the most powerful independent producer in, in the US, a man called Scott Rudin, who I'd known for years and years and years because he's a great theater buff and he sort of sees everything and knows everyone. And so I went to him, he was one of the people, and I said, would you produce the film? And he did, he agreed to produce the film with um, a friend of mine called Robert Fox. So he then, uh, we, we did that film, it was quite, successful. Um, Jim Broadbent won an Oscar and Judy was nominated for an Oscar and Kate Winslet was nominated for an Oscar. Um, and it was quite commercially successful. And then he said to me, shortly after it had been released, I've got this project for another project for Judy Dench. Uh, and she, he said, have you read this novel, Notes on a Scandal? I had read the novel. Um, and um, I said, yes, great idea, um, good part for Judy Dench, and then heard nothing for two and a half years. Uh, when he rang me up and said, um, the script has been, uh, I've got this script, will you do it? Uh, Notes on a scandal, and, and that's how it happened. So in that sense, I was director for hire. Uh, two questions on, on, on the business side that you, you've kind of touched on. F first, how do you go about pitching? Because as many, many writers, writer-directors are, are abysmally afraid of that. Does your theatrical background make it easy for you to say, okay, it's going to be a great movie, and how do you pitch Iris? Because she dies. Um, well, Judy Dench, you say, I've got Judy Dench. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. But um, with, with considerable difficulty, because of course the reason that Columbia Pictures didn't make the film mm -hmm was precisely because, as one script reader said in the notes, you know, I used to get pages and pages of notes from when it was at Columbia, said uh, the, the character John Bailey, the, the Jim Broadbent bent character, is not rootable. Rootability is why films get made. Rootability meaning, can you root for this character? Is the character sympathetic? And they thought an English literary critic was um, by definition an unsympathetic character. Plus the fact, as Harvey Weinstein, who eventually distributed it in the States, said to me, uh, he said, who wants to see a film about an unknown British novelist dying of Alzheimer's? Fair enough, Harvey, I said. Um, the, the, the truth was, it was very hard pitch, and it was made for very little money. Um, uh, I try and I think it was made for just, uh, I mean, very little. Films are ridiculous because they're so expensive. Three million pounds it, it was made for. Um, and and that's, it's quite hard to make a film uh, uh, um, for, for three, at that, with those aspirations. Mm. Um, but with tremendous difficulty. And I did have to pitch, you know, you pitch it as it's a love story. And that's, um, that's what it was. Uh, and they can sort of get love story, they can so, sort of get Judy Dench, but it's the Alzheimer's bit <laughs> that's difficult. Well, uh, I hope anyone that's seen it will agree that it, that it turned out very nicely. It's a very, very moving, uh, lovely film. Gareth, we have a clip. Uh, is that just about ready to go? What actually, actually involves young John and young Iris, and uh, I think in this clip uh, he's very sympathetic and rootable. I'm incredibly happy. Yeah. Uh, I'd, I'd actually forgotten I hadn't seen the film since, since we released it. And it was an absolutely um, glorious film to make. Um, not least because the, the structure of it was going between the old couple and the young couple. And they were all so fantastic. I, di I didn't know whether, I mean, the idea of casting a young Iris and an old Iris, um, when I cast Kate, uh, I thought, well, either it will work or it won't, but there's not going to be any in between. And Kate is ac actually physically nothing like 
Judy at all. She's, she's about three inches taller than Judy. She's quite, um, she's, she's broader than, than Judy. Uh, and her, her face has almost nothing in, in common with Judy. But there is a spirit about them that is identical. They're both very, very big hearted. They're both very generous. They're both immensely skillful actresses. And I, I think Kate is, is uh, absolute, will be the Judy Dench of you know, 30 years time. She was only 24 when we, we made that film. Um, and there is a spirit about them. And the first time, it was a terrifying moment where after I'd done the first scene with Kate and had to cut together with, with a scene of Judy's and um, we were cutting straight from Judy's face to Kate's face and somehow it, it worked and, um, and I can't really say why except that it either does or it doesn't and if it doesn't you're left throughout the whole film thinking who is this character? I just, they don't seem to have anything in common. Um, no, it was very happy. And of course, Hugh, I saw Hugh quoted the other day in, um, in a newspaper. Hugh's doing a film with Eric Cantona. And uh, he said, Eric Cantona has really got it, whatever it is. And the, the journalist reporting this said rather sweetly, Hugh Bonneville is underestimating himself. He's just as, got just as much it as Eric Cantona. And it is true, he's incredibly gifted and, and droll. The, the composer of the music, which is, which is a guy called James Horner, who did the score for um, Titanic, in fact. Um, James Horner went through scoring the entire movie thinking that Jim Broadbent and Hugh Bonneville were the same man and that it was brilliant artifice of, of <laughs> makeup. So I guess it, it, it worked. No, it, was, it was very, very, very happy. And for all the, um, I mean, people say that, see, my mother had Alzheimer's, and um, people say, well, it must have been very purgative. And it wasn't, it wasn't that at all. And I didn't do it because it was, had to do with Alzheimer's. Um, it was just that I knew the signs. And in fact, there's a, there's a scene in the film which is directly taken from my experience with my mother where, um, in, in fact, the moment that I knew that she was, it was genuinely degenerative disease as opposed to psychological disorder. When um, it's quite a surreal moment in the film where he opens a door for her and she looks at the opening of the door and she looks at the door itself uh, and says, which side do I go? And um, so there are things taken from life, but, but I think it's, it's somehow when you're working, it's just you're c concentrating so much on creating the moment that you're not reflecting either nostalgically or with pain about the past. That's the thing about film. It's, it's simply either it lives in the moment when the, the film is going through the camera, or it's dead, and if it's dead, it's, you know, there's nothing in the world you can do in editing to, to revive it. Do you still have some takes which you look back, rushes to stage, or in the edit, and it seemed great at the time, and it wasn't, or have you managed to, to realize on set when something's working or not, to get that? Um, I think with performances, and I was like, I'm, I'm wary, I started making films for the BBC. Um, and I, from a generation that didn't have, there were no video monitors when I started. And this is the beginning of the 80s. Now everybody is a vicarious director because there are monitors all over the set. When I was, uh, when I started to make films, you stood by the camera and trusted the operator. Uh, and you trusted your own instinct. And, and I learned quite early is what you see through the eye is what you're going to see on screen. Um, I mean, light does something, but the truth of a performance, it's either truthful to the eye or it's not truthful. It can be better, it can be transformed when you see it on, on screen and the light and some other the movement that can be a sort of alchemy. But essentially, if it's not, doesn't feel alive to the eye, 
then it's not alive. And I still stubbornly, to the fury of producers, I mean, certainly when on Notes on the Sky, I still stand by the camera rather than turning my back and, and looking at a monitor. Would you say that, uh, or how would you characterize your directing style if you think you have a specific one? Um, well, it's rarer than it ought to be to say I love actors. There are an awful lot of people who make films who don't. And I'm not sentimental about, you know, I know that actors can be, sometimes can be a pain in the ass, but so can directors. Uh, I know that they can be, you know, vain and, and self-obsessed. Um, I also know that the best actors are, tend to be very, very bright, even if they're not very articulate. They're very bright and interesting people. Um, so I am fascinated by good actors, really fascinated. Because they do something that I can't do, and I was an actor, and I know how difficult it is. And I know the difficulty with an actor, being an actor is that you've got to have a third eye. You've got to have a monitoring eye. You do what you do, which the job is making it look spontaneous, making it look real and yeah. spontaneous, as if it's just, as if you're making up the lines as, as you say them. Mm -hmm. Well, when I was an actor, I would, f the third eye was always looking down thinking, that's not quite truthful, no, 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 to the point that I became paralyzed. And I, I really, ha I had to stop acting. The, the fantastic thing about really good actors is that they can do that thing of making it look completely natural, and at the same time, they know exactly what they're doing. And this is true in theater and film. And they can say, oh, no, 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 I did, you know, I picked up the glass. It, 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 I thought it was better on that take, and I did it on this word. And it, they can talk about it in a very sort of mechanistic way and do it again and, do, and make it look completely spontaneous. That's the thing that fascinates me. That's the thing about really good actors. And, Every actor approaches it completely differently. Some actors need to, you know, I mean, famously, Daniel Day-Lewis gets in character at the beginning of the day and stays in character, which is when he's playing, you know, a butcher, the gang leader in, um, in uh, Gangs Scorsese's of Gangs of New York. You know, it can be quite heavy duty for the, <laughs> for the other actors, I think. But that's his way, and, and it's not... It's not an affectation for him. I did a film once where he played Kafka. It was a, a, a television film written by Alan Bennett called The Insurance Man. Um, lovely, I loved the film, wonderful script. And Dan played Kafka. And it was, that we were filming in Liverpool and you know, every morning I, I met Franz Kafka and he remained <laughs> Franz Kafka. And that's just the way of doing it. Other actors, Judy Dench for instance, is like 300 miles away from the character. She's incredibly conscientious, incredibly well prepared, but when you're setting up a shot, she'll more often than not be telling an anecdote, often slightly dirty anecdote, but, um, and, and gossiping. Um, and, and she has you know, wonderful gossip, she loves gossip, and then she, quite often she does this. And on, on Iris, the editor used to kept, um, he, he hated cutting off the, the, <laughs> the bits before, you know, there's a clapperboard. Yes. Uh, and you start, the, the director says, turn over. So the camera and sound turn over. Uh, and so there's film running through the camera. Then the clapperboard comes down uh, and the director says, action. So what happens is the editor cuts off the bits uh, after, you know, the, before the, the, the director, before the action starts. But he couldn't bear to cut it off because what fascinated him, and there was one particular scene where Judy was just, there was a sort of glimmer of thought, still in, of life still in the brain. And uh, John Bailey was reading to her a passage from Pride and Prejudice. And she appeared to be completely dead in the eyes and then said, I wrote. Um, and so there was some sort of connection. 
And it was, it was absolutely fascinating because you were looking at somebody who, to all intents and purposes, was brain dead. Um, Judy, this, this, this take, and it was a big, big close-up, so you couldn't lie. Judy was um, telling this story, uh, and as I said, turnover, finishing the story, the last word of, of the story, she then roared with laughter, uh, and, uh, and this, the, the clapperboard came down, and I said, action, and there are two frames after action where you could say, that's Judy Dench, and then she became, then she was... Iris Murdoch in the later stages of, of Alzheimer's. It's just really freaky. And, but it, the, the thing that I compare it to is if you've ever been to an orchestral rehearsal or, you know, with first-rate musicians, what's rather alarming is that they start, they sometimes when they're rehearsing, you'd say, there's this great solo violin, say, um, and the conductor will say, all right, let's pick it up from bar 125 and brings, gives them the downbeat. They go into orchestra and, and soloist, go into on the first beat of bar 125. There's not like two bars while they warm up to it. They're there like that. And, 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 and that's what it's like with really, re really skillful actors. Awesome. Do, do you um, insist on time to rehearse when when making films, and how much? Well, the whole business of rehearsal is quite difficult because, uh, as I said, what you're aiming for is the simulation of spontaneity. Sometimes it's that simulation of spontaneity is better preserved or protected by a sort of um, keeping surprise going so that you agree a sort of broad strategy but you don't rehearse in detail. Sometimes it's good to just rehearse in detail and I like sitting around a table, not doing standing up rehearsals but just talking through it and reading it and reading it and talking through it so that the actors have a sense of what choices they can make rather than um, coming to the set sort of having to make choices Right. without preparation. Um, it's difficult. Some actors don't like rehearsing for film, but then a lot of directors hate rehearsing for film because they think, I'm just going to be stuck in a room with actors and what am I going to say to them? Uh, whereas I like being stuck in a room with, with, with actors. Um, so it, it really varies. And sometimes if you've got a complicated physical scene, you really have to rehearse it. But the actual rehearsing, you know, sometimes if you're doing a scene where the camera's moving and the actor's moving, you simply have to rehearse it. And so, you know, you spend maybe two hours rehearsing it, by the end of which actors, you know, get into the scene. But, you know, what looks casual on uh, camera is, you know, highly artificial. They have to hit marks on the floor. You know, you put down an actor moves and they put down tape marks and the actor has to hit those marks. So these brilliant people, the focus pullers, who are watching the actor and they're watching the actor's feet and they see the actor overstep the mark and they make the correction. And they are dazzlingly skillful, the, the good focus pullers. Um, and they go, they have this remote control and they're going like that and watching watching the actors and when you've got a complicated choreography of a scene everybody the crew the actor it's kind of wonderful dance but yes you have to rehearse it very little on a film is is accident it has to be planned and you don't have the time or the money not to plan things you know you have to know what you're filming and i think quite often people think it's sort of made up as you go along and that's how you achieve spontaneity um, it, it's, it's just not, it, it's, it's infinite preparation in order to allow yourself the five, ten percent of invention on the spot. Uh, you talked about some of the, 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 the great and skillful actors you've uh, been able to work with, but what happens 
when somebody's just not getting it? That must have, or has that, has that not happened for years? Um, what what do you well, I've always thought that I felt, you know, implicated, culpable, because if they can't get it, then it's probably your, your fault for casting them. Um, it's, it's very difficult. I mean, the thing, it, it's the same in the theatre. The good ones are able to animate space. Fun, funny when you're less and less, when I'm working in the theatre, I tend not to say, you stand there, you stand there, you stand there, you stand there. I love just letting the actors sort of bounce around the space and then they, they kind of form the relationships and uh, you see it kind of forming like a hologram. But um, the bad actors are always in the wrong place. <laughs> And they can never, and, and it's the same on film. The, the good actors have a one, they sort of vaguely say, what size is, what's the shot? And you say, like that, or, the, or loose. And then they have a sense of how they're, it's again the third eye, of how they're putting themselves in the frame, how they make the frame interesting, you know, whether their hand's in the frame or not. Or the bad ones just, Anything you do, it just looks wrong and lumpish. So the, the truth is that you just try and put them in the dark. Or <laughs> um, I, and film, you can, you, can, you can put them in the dark. You can shoot the back of their heads. You can also revoice them. Have you, <laughs> have you, have you you've done that in the past? Off the record? Um, I've certainly have put in lines of, yeah. Mm. So. Excellent. <laughs> not, not often, no. Well, well we have a, a clip now which doesn't look like that has had any uh, ADR. Uh, Gareth, is that ready to come? This one, this time from Notes on a Scandal. That, uh, that young actor has a hell of a find. Where did you... Uh, yeah. um, I'm not going to report you. Uh, well, we had, I thought it was going to be very easy. I thought we'd walk into a North London school and find, you know, Islington's answer to James Dean. Um, we saw about 500 boys. Um, eventually, we, it started in North London, then South London. We did the whole of London. We did Bristol. We did Manchester. We did Birmingham. We did Scotland. And this boy, uh, we did... Dublin, and um, he was just, you know, I just thought he was uh, terrific, very, very bright. He was just 16 when we made that film. Very, very bright, um, really wonderful eyes, and sort of plausible. And also the, 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 the thing of being, he's from Derry, being um, Northern Irish, actually in the school that we filmed in, there was something like it was a school in Islington um, that 10 years ago had the reputation of being the worst school in Britain. Um, it's n now turned, been turned round by the brilliant headmaster. But um, in that school, virtually everybody in the school um, was a first generation of, of immigrants. So there were a lot of, the rare thing to find in that school was anybody who came, you know, whose, whose parents had lived um, in the neighborhood for more than one generation. So there were Irish <coughs> kids in that school. There were a lot of Lithuanians, uh, Latvians, there were Russian kids, there were Croatian kids, there were Somali kids, there were Bangladeshi. And so it's just seemed that he fitted in. But interesting that scene, because you say no ADR. Actually, there is ADR in that scene. He says a line that he isn't speaking, that is... Uh, and the whole scene, that's an incredibly difficult scene to film. It was filmed, it was pouring with rain when we filmed that. It was filmed on a, a, on a street where, um, in, in um, somewhere in North London, I can't remember where, oh, Camden. Um, the traffic, we couldn't stop the traffic. Traffic, there was, it was very noisy. It was a difficult scene anyway. The scene is radically cut. And, and substantial part of that scene is, is changed from its original intention, i.e. rewritten. Plus, there is one shot in it that is actually 
reversed. It's, that's to say that the film runs backwards because what happened at the end of the scene is he just grabbed, um, he kissed her uh, and then put his hands up and uh, went away. Um, and we reversed it um, so, so that we use, because he took his hands away slowly, uh, so that him, when he goes, puts his hands up, yeah. that's actually the film running backwards. Because we decided what we wanted was in this scene for him to kiss her, and this would be the first moment, the first move, and he'd need to slowly kiss her. I think we, all, we reversed it and also slowed it down. So, um, I shouldn't have, the magic has gone now. Uh, and also, there was, <laughs> there was stuff there that we took out of the scene and then put in a bit of her voice over to, to make it focus. So, it, it's not true throughout the film, but that f the film, the first cut of the film, was 134 minutes long. It's now a 92 minute film. And you think, well, where is it all gone and why did you think it was all essential, you know, the, to shoot all that stuff? Um, well, you just do. And if you can't sort of anticipate what you're gonna need and you think, you go in in good faith and you think this scene is essential because we've got to understand that. This scene's essential, we've got to, cross the T here, dot the I there, and then you find when you're cutting it that actually you can push things together, you can distill things, you can reduce things, condense things, and you somehow can't second guess that. And that's the sort of profligacy of film that um, you have, and, and, um, and also there is a whole scene that was, uh, we, four months, after we'd finished shooting, we had uh, five days where we reshot or we shot some new scenes. Um, and um, the scene where she, actually this is spoiling it for those of you who hadn't seen it, but there's a scene, a meltdown scene, where finally um, uh, Barbara, as Judy Dench's character, her cat has be put down and she wants her friend Sheba to go with her and bury the cat and um, and Sheba refuses for reasons you'll discover uh, and that whole scene was a scene shot uh, on one day I mean it's a fantastic scene which they play brilliantly total nightmare to shoot because it's about a four minute scene it had to be shot in a short day because Judy was playing in hay fever in the West End so we had to finish with her by half past five uh, and it's a scene where um, I mean I find it hard and the cameraman Chris Menges can't watch it because the light keeps changing uh, the sun is out then the sun isn't out the sun keeps and it was shot in a in a street and we couldn't really stop the traffic so a lot of it is shot sort of across the street rather than looking down the street. Um, so I look at it and think, oh no, this is, it's like a sort of train crash. <laughs> but it somehow, it, it works, and it works because of it's got a ferocious energy about it. Well, funnily enough, uh, that's the final scene we've chosen to show. Um, uh, uh, it's my favorite scene of the film. And um, uh, is it ready, ready to go, Gareth? Excellent. This is the confrontation outside the house. Is that? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> that looked like it was easy to do, Richard. I don't know. Well, I know. I know. Uh, ideally, you shouldn't remember the the circumstances, but that it's just impossible for me to watch that scene without remembering the the circumstances of of shooting it. Um, it was just. It was just so physically d difficult, and um, I mean, it probably is wrong to, to just talk, lift the veil on it. And when you watch it in the context of the film, you know, you, you don't know. But um, somehow, some things you look at when you look at back at a film and think, "Ooh, that's rather better than I 
imagine. And some things you think do, they don't improve with time. But it is, as I say, it's just those two, uh, well, three, Bill Nye and, and Kate and, and Judy, just the, the abs conviction and, and uh, truth of their, their performances. It, it's just dazzling. Um, well, I'm going to throw it open in just, just a couple of minutes, but I, I have uh, one or two more. In fact, that person putting their hand up has made me literally forget the question I was going to ask. <laughs> oh, the, mu the music was, um, was, uh, was quite so strong in that scene, and I heard that it was worked on a lot after the film to get the effect that, that you did. Um, how, how well, you it was work the thing is that we hadn't decided on a composer, um, and we were well into editing. Um, we, there were various people who were, I was suggesting, and uh, Scott Rudin, the producer, said, no, no, they're not right, they're not right. And then he said to me, he had worked with Philip Glass on the hours, and he said, um, you should meet Philip. Um, the thing about film music is that uh, more and more, it's very much the, you know, the province of producer, studio, um, because it can be done and you, people can write, you can have one score and the composer could get fired and you can have another score. And somehow, though you're penny pinching during shooting, there somehow always seems to be money for composers, you know, when afterwards. Uh, you know, where was the money when you needed it? But, um, so I met Philip and I really, I, I absolutely fell in love with Philip. He's the most wonderful, uh, very, very compelling man. And his music is very idiosyncratic. It's, um, and he says, I don't write film music. He said, I just don't write film music. But I had an, um, I wanted it to be sort of a bit like Bernard Herrmann, you know, a bit like uh, those Bernard Herrmann scores for Hitchcock films. And he was game for that. What he gives it is a sort of pulse and a kind of um, florid quality that it, it acts as the voice, the sort of, um, com the inner voice of Barbara Covert, of Judy's character. In some way, the music is this frantic uh, heart of, of uh, and, and tormented soul of, of Judy Dent. Um, I mean, just on a matter of taste, and if you're talking the, the distinction between British, Scott Rudin was always insistent that he said, I don't want this to be like a small British movie. I said, thank you, put in my place. So, uh, by which he meant it's got to play to an American audience and not an art house audience. And for him it was important that the music had that kind of visceral uh, attack. Um, for my taste and Philip's taste, um, there, are, there are moments where I would have, A, it would have been less forceful volume, but also there are moments where I um, didn't want music and we have got music. But actually, I felt that very strongly when we were mixing it and now I don't feel it. So um, I, 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 he, it, he's a very, very brilliant composer. Which, which is your favorite part of the whole process? Pre-production, production, post-production? Post -production? Well, one of the reasons I like, I, I'm very, very, very lucky because I have been able to go between working in the theater and making films. It's very, very difficult because if you work in the theater, unlike films, if somebody asks you to do a play, if you get a, they say, come and rehearse, you know, 1st of October, and you turn up and you, you know, you sign a contract. If somebody says, make a film, they, you know, it's always delayed. It's, there's never a proper start date and there's never a finish date. So if you try and plan your, your life, it's a nightmare. I mean, with Iris, I, I was booked to direct an opera and, at the Aix-en-Provence festival. And so we finished shooting a week before I started directing and I edited the film. The first seven weeks of editing of the film were in a little house in Aix-en-Provence where the editors we're only too pleased to bring the gear down there, but it's, it's actually no more expensive to edit a film in Aix-en-Provence, in a house in Aix-en-Provence, but actually slightly cheaper than hiring a cutting room in, in Soho. <laughs> so it's very, it, 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 it's very hard, but what I love about, I mean, I, I like doing what I'm doing at the time. What's, um, hard, it is hard to arrange the dates, 
I like, what I like about film is that you're working with three different groups of people in the preparation, the shooting, and the post-production. And, and they have very, very sort of distinct, distinctly different characters to them. And the process is, is very, very different. The rhythms are, are very different. Um, and, and it's sort of contemplation, action, reflection. That, that, uh, whereas in theatre, it's much more linear and incremental, and you sit in a rehearsal room and gradually the thing grows in front of you. Uh, I have more questions, which I might chip in with later, but um, uh, that gentleman there. Hi, um, yeah, during Iris, did the um, younger set back to the older set? Hello, sorry. Um, yeah, during the shooting of Iris, did the younger set of actors get a chance to work with the older set of actors to work out their uh, formation of the character or characters? Um, no, uh, there was. Um, we had a few days' rehearsal with the four. I mean, they had met before. Um, no, uh, both. The, I, I showed a few rushes. But not much, because I didn't want, I, I didn't want an imitation from either of them. I just, um, both Kate and Hugh wanted to hear the voices, Judy's voice and, and, and Jim's voice. Um, and the first scene of the film that we shot um, was uh, a scene where Judy comes into a studio, um, a control room, of a studio at the BBC and sees her young self on the screen. And so Judy, um, that was actually almost, I think, the first shot of the film, was a close-up of Judy watching, in real time, watching Kate on the screen. And it was, so Judy's expression is absolutely fan fantastic because there's what she's supposed to be playing is this, fascination of the older person looking back at their young self. And Judy was playing that, added to this curiosity about how Kate was going to play her character. Uh, on, on the subject of the, of the actresses. Uh, can I just say, oh, yeah. actually, I just remembered that we, of course, had to shoot the black and white film of, of Kate um, uh, doing this interview, the young Iris. And we shot it at, we were based at Pinewood Studios, and we shot it in the office of um, Gerald Thomas, the producer of the Carry On films. <laughs> um, uh, it's, it's a sad fact that most films these days don't have great roles for women, and yet yours do. Is that a conscious decision, or, or do you not think of ever in those terms? Um, well, I like women. <laughs> I mean, I, I know, I, I'm sort of, I don't know, I, I think that's more, more an accident. Mm. Um, I happen to think there are a lot of really, really interesting um, British actresses who are older women. Um, and, but sort of, it, it's, I mean, I, I would love to be able to say, no, I feel, you know, it's, it's a lifelong determination to get more women on the screen and, you know, that women are, well, I mean, it's, true that women are underrepresented, underrepresented in women's lives, but I, I'm not, I can't really claim that this is a crusade. Sure. It's, it's, it's a happy accident. I'm surprised, at uh, uh, the front, hang on, up to next. Hi, um, it was getting back to your difficult scenes and things, and you said some of them sometimes seem better than they did before, and I was wondering how much of a role sound design plays in that whether you think in, in post-production how much of a, a role sound design goes towards making those th scenes seem better than they were before? Um, absolutely. There's, there's a, I mean, the sound design in the scene that you saw then, there's a whole life going on inside the car, of the kids inside the car, that is, is an essential fuel for, the, um, for upping the tension between... Um, Barbara and, and Sheba. So I, I think it's really the sound design is, is the kind of fourth dimension in, in the scene. And um, it's, it's easily overlooked. Um, it can really make 
a scene, you know, add something to a, a scene that isn't there. Um, I mean, certainly in, in Notes on a Scandal, there are scenes where the presence of the journalists outside the house and hearing this constant yammer of the journalists really adds a, a dimension that, um, you know, wouldn't be there with, with, without it. So very important. And it's quite often um, you run out of time and don't get um, what are called wild tracks when you're actually shooting on location. You have to fight and the sound man has to fight uh, because sound always comes, you know, sort of order of priority. Uh, everybody wants to move on once you've got the picture right and the sound is something like, I've got to get this sound uh, or I've got to, you know, we've got to record this line uh, again and it's quite you've sometimes got to jump to the defense of the, of the sound man when you're shooting. Uh, a question at the front here. We'll just wait for the uh, microphone, if you don't mind. Hello. Um, you were saying before about the music and how at the time when you were making the film, um, you were possibly unsure about some of the elements of the music. And I was wondering, as a director, how much you feel you have to negotiate with all of the many, many people that you work with and how much you can really press and push for exactly what you feel is right at the time? Well, um, good question. The truth is, and going back to what I was saying earlier, the media like to, and, and you know, directors themselves like to propagate the myth that the director is the soul, the auteur, the maker of the film. The truth is that there are a lot of interested parties and they're not interested parties just because they've got power. First of all, this film was made by Fox Searchlight which is a sort of junior division of um, 20th Century Fox, you know, the big company that is owned by Rupert Murdoch. Fox Searchlight has made a lot of very successful films um, under the leadership of a man called Peter Rice and um, the, Claudia Lewis, uh, who is the sort of his senior executive. And they've done it by keeping budgets down to, um, uh, capping budgets at that this film was 15 million dollars it's a huge amount of money but in film terms um, it's it's very low budget and they've kept it down ruthlessly all their films their recent films have been last king of scotland little miss sunshine they've had a very good run um, uh, and so first of all there's peter rice there's claudia lewis there's couple of other people at Fox Searchlight. Then there is Scott Rudin, who, as I mentioned, is far and away the most powerful independent producer in, in the US. Uh, is a very, very powerful man, a very authoritative man, and a very authoritarian man. He has very, very strong views. Then there's um, his co-producer, Robert Fox. Then there's the uh, writer Patrick Marber, who I'd worked with at the National Theatre. In fact, I commissioned his first two plays. Um, so they would, then there's the editor, John Bloom was the, the editor. Um, and John is very, very distinguished editor, sort of grand old man of, of British film editing. So those would be the principal players, all of whom have very, very, very strong views about what the film should be. So the idea that the director would, say, would be saying, well, that's, that's my statement, and that's, you know, that they just say, go away, all right, we'll do it without you. I mean, if at any point, and there were points where I thought, we can, I do not agree with this. Um, you know, where we were fighting over one scene or another, as you do with, with any film. If I had said, all right, I'm walking out, they would have said, okay, thank you very much. That's, that's, go. Because, you know, you can finish a film without the director. Um, and a lot of films are finished without the director. You don't know about it. So it's, 
it's called, benignly, we call it collaboration. And it, and it often is collaboration. It's often that, uh, you know, there may have been times when Peter Rice, head of, may, and I don't know, I suspect that there was, t when he and Scott might not have been seeing eye to eye, and Peter would have been saying, I don't care whether you don't agree, this is what I want, or I'm not releasing this film. Or, you know, I'm taking the film. In the end, you know, the studio are paying for the film. They pay, put up a lot of money. And so, in my view, they have a perfect right to assert themselves. They actually were fantastically respectful of all the makers. But, um, you know, when, when you get into big, big, big money, things can get, obviously, very, very brutal because the, there's an awful lot at stake. So, I don't know if that answers your question, but it wasn't, um, there were times when it was quite tough, but I'm very, very happy with the film we made. That's a question. I just wondered, are they sitting there with a two-way mirror? Like watching you, are they sitting there with a two-way mirror watching you? And it sounds like they're kind of there seeing how things go and if they don't like it. And well, what, how, how no, there's not the two steps. Uh, to... uh, you are, you're, you're, when you're shooting the film, um, it's not a two-way mirror. I mean, sometimes, you know, there are times when Peter was on set or Claudia was on set and Scott Rudin was on set all the time. So. When you come to, from the theatre, where you're used to rehearsing in private, uh, and then, you know, at a certain point, releasing what you've worked on, but film directing is very, very public. It's very hard to carve out those really private moments. And the more, I mentioned earlier, these proliferation of, of video monitors, so that you have people all around you who are looking at what you're shooting, who've all got opinions. So you can find yourself with half a dozen d different directors, you know, all with views about what you should be doing. And... Sounds like a nightmare. It's, it's sometimes quite hard not to be paranoid or not to be sort of chippy, just say, you know, can I just do this? Um, and so it, it, it is an effort sometimes to go, Okay, I li I'm listening to what you have to say. I'm listening to what you have to say. I'm taking it very seriously. And, and also, not to get into an attitude of mind where you're immune to a really brilliant suggestion. Mm -hmm. You know, and often, you haven't got it. Of course you haven't got it right. Uh, where people are standing detached and they see things sometimes clearer than you do. But you are... It's, it can be... You know, there are an awful lot of people on a film set and they sort of smell day one. You know, mostly you haven't worked with them. You know, they're, uh, you know you've know, you worked with the, probably the, the, the principal guys, like, you know, the director of photography and the sound recordist and, you know, the um, designer and so on. But uh, there are a lot of strangers day one and the thing they're thinking is, does this bloke know what he's doing? So, you know, expressing doubt, you know, going, oh, I don't know what to do. Um, it's, you've got to be kind of immensely confident and in some way certain of what you're doing, even if you don't know, even if you're saying, you've, you've, you have to be confident um, or give a very good um, imitation of it. It's, um, and, and it's, it's very, very interesting, the whole sort of psychology dynamic of a film set. There's a question at the back. Uh, Beth? Hello. Um, I was very fortunate that I trained in your wonderful National Theatre 10 or 12 years ago. And I've noticed that since you left, you've done an awful lot of directing. Um, and you were talking just now about leadership. Really, I wanted to ask you about what are the different qualities required to run an institution and still create work, as you did at the National, but also the difference between that and perhaps running individual projects. And 
what you found the differences to be in terms of um, your own processes creatively? Um, well, when I got to the National Theatre, the National Theatre had the board had the year before commissioned a survey that it was felt that it was sort of quite dysfunctional, the management of the National Theatre. They'd commissioned a survey under the, um, uh, under a guy called Lord Rayner, who used to run Marks and Spencer. He got in Coopers and Librand, the management consultants, and a guy, the guy who ran the project of surveying the National Theatre management was a guy called Ed Straw, who was Jack Straw's brother. I got to know Ed very, very well because he was the man who understood the anatomy of the National Theatre, which is um, open 52 weeks of the year. There are three auditoriums, has a, a staff of about 800, 850. So a big organisation. And I used to talk to him obsessively, and I had the job of turning round the management of the National Theatre in the light of the report of the... Rayner report, and um, I do remember a guy um, who called George Bain, who was an expert on industrial relations, talking to him when I first took, just before I took over, and he said to me, and he was part of, on the panel of this Rayner report, he said to me, actually, the um, relations between staff and management at the National Theatre are the worst I've ever encountered. He said they're actually worse than the National Coal Board. <laughs> I thought, thanks a bunch, mate. Um, anyway, that, so um, that was what I inherited. And I went to, to Ed, and I talked this through with Ed, and I said, look, Ed, I just don't know management. What do I know about management? And he said, well, how long have you been directing? I said, uh, at the time, I think it was about 25 years. He said, well, you have the experience and the practical expertise that every single manager in this country envies. Because when they go on their weekend courses improving management, what they do is they do projects which are exactly like the, directing a production. He said, tell me what you do when you direct a production. I said, well, you put together a team, you cast them, you know, you cast your designer, you work together, you try and get them all working to a common aim, walking to the same agenda, you're conscious of the different abilities and different hierarchies, and you, I, said, I suppose you manage the project. He said, well, there you are. How many productions have you done? I said, I don't know, about 150. He said, well, so you know management. And it was true that the, the, the macro, the micro and the macro, you know, being, and of course, he said, you also have this great um, running a national theatre. Um, in a theatre, you have this um, unique perspective, which is you're working on the shop floor, creating part of the product. So you're hearing people are treating you as a director, and you're hearing what the workforce, you know, the, the, the unskilled or um, manual workforce are saying. And then you go up to your office, and you've got the bird's eye view of the organization, and you're able to, to compute you know, the, the, the two ends of the, uh, uh, of, of the spectrum. So that sort of, if that answers your question, the, the running an, an institution, and it's just that, of course, it's what you have to remember is that institutions have uh, a, a sort of gravitate, the sort of law of gravity is institutions have a sort of um, gravitational force towards being more concerned with them, themselves as an institution than what it is that they do. And you see this often in, you know, when I used to work at the BBC, of people thinking that somehow the life of the BBC as an institution was more important than whether the BBC made good programmes. So you always have to hold on to what does the National Theatre exist for? It exists to make productions, put productions on stage, it only justifies it, its existence if those productions are, are any good. And then the other thing that I realized sort of early on is that if you're running 
the National Theatre, you have to cultivate the opposite of schadenfreude, which is taking joy in other people's miseries. Uh, I don't know what the word, if there's a German scholar, the opposite of schadenfreude is, would be taking joy in other people's successes. That you have to take joy in endowing other people and making possibly, frequently, much greater successes out of their shows, you know, rival directors, you have to kind of suppress the competitive instinct and take joy in just endowing other people's work. Does that answer your question? We have to uh, wrap it up in a couple of minutes, sadly, but I wanted to touch on um, uh, something actually in our program notes. There's a quote from you on, under the uh, heading of advice for budding filmmakers. You are quoted as saying, just make films. If people think of it as a business, they're already doomed. People exaggerate this whole business of networking and it's all B, star, 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 star. The only thing that gets a film made is having a good script. Would you add anything to that? Yeah, I, I mean, it's slightly um, utopian, but I would say that I do get depressed by people talking about the film industry, the film business. Um, oddly, in the theatre, we don't talk about the theatre business, the, the, the theatre industry. You talk about a piece of theatre that you want to make, a piece of theatre, a script that you want to make. And I, I do think that, you know, that, that people have to fight for, for content. And, and uh, it's very, it is very difficult. I'm not saying... It's very, very difficult to get a film made, and I feel so incredibly lucky to have, in the last few years, made three films, because it's so preposterously expensive, because even if you make it, it's only halfway there. You then have to get it distributed, and even if you get it distributed, you have to somehow hope that people turn up to the, to the party, but it does all start with the script, and, and the script is your prospectus. That's your selling document uh, and that's why you know it's it's a good idea is is only sort of the kernel of it it's the, the, the actually working at achieving a really good script is uh, that's the holy grail and they're very hard to come by it's, it, 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 that's why in the end more good films don't get made was it tough on this film working with another writer? Because, you know, as, a, as, a, as somebody with great experience writing yourself, um, uh, were there times when you thought, crumbs, I could do better than that? Or was it great to have someone else do the hard work? No, I, I'm, I'm a, I don't think I have written and I've adapted plays and I've written scripts, but I'm not, I don't think of myself like, you know, Patrick Marber, who was a writer, you know, the joy of finding Patrick when I was at the National and doing Dealer's Choice and Closer, the national. He's, you know, he's a really original writer, whereas I think I'm... And, and when I write, Iris was written with Charles Wood, who is a very, very original writer, um, who wrote a number of brilliant plays and, and movie scripts. Charge of the Light Brigade was his. Um, so I'm, I'm the sort of... more of the architect. Um, so I don't think of myself as primary writer. And the film film that I'm writing at the moment, I'm writing with Charles. Uh, I am writing something that is just, is all my own, but um, that's uh, causing my hair to go grey. <laughs> uh, we have got time for maybe one or two last questions. We'll have that lady at the front and that at the back, and that may be it. Hello, um, I was just wondering how far, if at all, you thought that your many years in a the theatre affected the way that you direct film? Well, I think in many ways working in the theatre is, is the worst training for, for um, working in film, except that, you know, the common currency is actors and working with actors and, and thinking about storytelling. And s about three years ago, I was with Ken Loach, and we were talking about people, how people get into filmmaking. And I said to Ken, well, what do you tell them? He says, I always say, go and work in the theatre. Uh, and this is Ken Loach, who you think of as a man who is wholly of the world of, of cinema. But and what he meant was precisely that, that they get experience at telling stories and working with actors at a, at a sort of zero budget. 
No, but whereas, you know, getting to make a short film, is, it's very, very difficult. So what you have to unlearn, what the thing of theatre is that in theatre you're, you're always, you've got the same point of view, physical point of view, and in film you have the capacity constantly to change the audience's point of view of where they're looking, to make choices of who they're looking at and how they're looking at. And I had a wonderful demonstration. The first film I directed was with a brilliant BBC cameraman who'd done a lot of documentaries and drama. He was called Nat Crosby. And we, I set up a scene and I was watching it, sort of, as it were, straight on there. And he started walking around the back of the actors. I thought, what's he doing? And then he beckoned to me. And I walked round the back and I could immediately see that he was saying, actually, it's much more interesting looking at this scene of two people talking from their backs. They're much more eloquent than, than there, which was the sort of theatre instinct. And then the feeling that, you know, either move the camera or move the actor, the, the essence of constantly of changing a point of view or the, the way that in, in theatre you always think, persuade the audience to look at the person who's talking. That's the focus. Whereas frequently in film, you're not interested in looking at the person talking, you're, you're interested in seeing the person who's responding to the person who's talking. And, you know, changing the size of shot of, of uh, you know, whether you're watching what you can achieve in a wide shot, I suppose. Whereas, as, as a friend of mine scornfully says of the theater, I don't like the theater, it's all in wide shot. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen Frears. But, um, but uh, so, you know, it's, it, uh, and it did take me, I don't know, perhaps it, it shows that I'm still, you know, theatre animal, but it um, takes, I now think that I think in, in sort of film terms, but um, the habits die hard. Uh, the question at the back. Um, I understand you're quite unusual in always having the writer on set with you during a film production, or certainly with uh, Patrick Marber. Um, do you think that comes from partly being a writer yourself, or what's your thinking behind that? Um, it's not so much being a writer myself as, as um, the theatre, again, theatre practice, is that um, you would generally, you know, you have the writer in, in rehearsals. Um, in film, the writer doesn't have the primacy that uh, a theatre writer, but Scott Rudin would absolutely insist that the writer was there, and he would insist on the primacy of script, that you are shooting what's written. Now, what's written is not just dialogue. It's scenes that, you know, you're shooting mute scenes, that there, there are no lines you know, of, of dialogue in, but you're saying, we've agreed that this is what this scene means. We've had endless conversations about having to set up, you know, this scene in a street and you've got wide shot of street and such and such a thing has to happen. So if the director arrives and says, oh no, I'm just changing that, so then, you know, the writer will say, hang on, are, are, you do, are you aware that this is gonna mean X, Y, and Z, not what we had agreed it, it means? So, I don't think it's bad, although it does add to the sort of quantum <laughs> of anxiety. Yeah. Um, uh, we could go on, but sadly we're going to have to leave it there. Um, I, have, I have a few thank yous to say as well. Uh, firstly, obviously, the watershed for letting us have the space for nothing, which allows us to let everybody come for nothing. Thanks to James for doing the interpreting, uh, Gareth on the audiovisual stuff and Jeff on the door, everyone from UE for filming it, uh, Cam and BAFTA for sponsoring us also, Simon for his lovely introduction, and most importantly, uh, Richard for uh, an enlightening lecture. Thank you very much Thanks, indeed. Simon.